Hey, what's up, guys? It's Rico here, CEO of Source Financia, host of Made in China podcast, obviously the host of the Source Financia YouTube channel. So I'm back with another, another one. one. This is a video cast uh, coming to you live from the Refined. If you guys recognize it from my previous videos, and I'm sitting across from this gentleman over here. Hi, guys. I'm Alexander Avans, and I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark. All right, awesome. So in this video, we're going to be uh, talking about Alex's journey, you know, how he's transitioned from Denmark to the Philippines, what that's been like, the sort of corporate life here, and then a little bit of his personal life and backstory. So, uh, let's start at the beginning. One of my favorite questions to ask is when you meet somebody in a social setting and you're not in the Philippines, how do you answer the question, what do you do? <laughs> That's a very nice way of framing it. Um, I think it depends on who's asking, of course, but I'd say that my, my professional title is that I'm, I build a career as an entrepreneur. Um, I specialized in going into businesses that are already existing and figuring out how to perhaps accelerate or develop or enhance certain value propositions that might have been neglected within these businesses. Um, I do this from a technological point of view. I use, I guess you can call it, emerging technologies within a vast field of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, biotechnology, to to allow myself to speak about how new options are possible where they might not before have been possible. So you can call it that evangelistic approach to technology consulting almost. <laughs> I think one, one thing uh, people are going to notice through this interview is I think Alex is one of the smartest people I know. Also one That's of the most well-read people I know. So uh, you're going to have to simplify some of your language. Let's try. <laughs> Let's try. Okay, can you give like a case study? Yeah. Uh, just an example of a business that you worked in. Yes, yes. So. I think one of my favorite case studies was um, was actually an airport. When, when I was a, a consultant, we helped the airport in the country understand that the future of transit might not be getting people from A to B, but actually expanding beyond the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, how far you want to go. And now we are not solutions providers. We don't come and tell you exactly how to do it, but we allow people to think beyond the current capacity. So I think the easiest way of saying how I work is I tell you how to think, but not what to think. Yeah. So when it comes to building companies within companies, I try to take people out of the comfort zone and invite them to play with a new mindset. And in this regard, come up with ideas that they can actually implement. Okay, awesome. So how did you uh, how did you get into this field initially? Where did you study, and then what brought you to Manila? Yeah. So I guess starting from the beginning, I was terrible at school. Yeah. I mean, I'm I, I have a master's in economics and business development with a specialization in neuroscience. So I ended up doing good in school. Uh, I think I'm one of those rebels that argue against the the main entrepreneurial notion that people should quit university and just go out and do it because I think university is a great sandbox that allows you to perhaps not play with practice but play with theory and throughout my high school I just failed miserably I mean I came out of high school completely degenerate I had no grades to be able to study further I started working but I quickly found out that there were specific fields of thought that I found very interesting mm -hmm. and over time, I managed to get into university and I built up my, I guess, my professional curriculum as, uh, as an economist, behavioral economist. Um, and that led me into technology because I think technology fundamentally changes the way we act. 
I think that's the prime example is to see how we interact with our smartphones and our laptops on a daily age and all the things that we are now can do. But it really starts yeah, with recording a, our recording a video, a video podcast. I mean, all these things are enabled by a new behavior that essentially comes from technology. So I invented my own career. I started working with this field of behavioral technology where you use new fields of technology as a way of presenting ideas, mm -hmm. allowing people to think beyond um, where their current scope is. And, and this brought me into a, a wide array of working with big corporates and working with governments and schools. Uh, now, over time, I just started my own engagement. I started out with a local consultancy in Copenhagen. And as I started my own consultancy, at one point, I, I flew all around the world doing talks about these things uh, and how you think using these new narratives of technology. And it led me to Manila. And I remember doing a talk in Manila two years ago where the company I'm currently from approached me afterwards. I came down from the stage and they wanted to discuss how to do some of these things I talk about. You know, that's the trick about being a talker. <laughs> At one point in your career, you were challenged to actually do the walking, right? <laughs> and they offered me a very fantastic opportunity after half a year of negotiation about coming back and leading the innovation department here. It's a big Filipino conglomerate. And uh, that basically allowed me to freely act of my mindset and how I see my thinking in practice, which has been everything else but easy. I think that's the biggest surprise for me. Coming here, fantastic. But actually working on doing this implementation is a painful endeavor. I have, I have a lot of questions around that. But you go just ahead. Just ba backtracking to uh, high school. Yes. So, I mean, obviously you're an intelligent guy. Why do you think, uh, why do you think high school is so difficult for you? Well, I mean... Is it, is it the way you were taught? Is it the subjects that, that you're being taught? Like what? So, I guess I'm... I'm, I, I like to say I'm still a kid that likes to dream and that likes to play with, you know, the, the aspect of fantasy and curiosity and so on and so forth. And I think the static environment in high school still to this date is much more designed after almost like a, a manufacturing plant, yeah, plant right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you are designed to pursue something that comes next, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you are allowed to pursue this if you get good grades, right? So you have to be incredibly good at something very specific that's measured at a, you know, two-digit output. And I think the idea of me being measured on this, I tried. I think I, I tried very hard over a lot of years, but I was never able to hit that, you know, defined outcome that the schooling system desired. Mm -hmm. And it was very demotivating. I mean, I was raging against the system. I mean, I, I worked for future education in Denmark for a number of years because I honestly felt the educational system is flawed behind repair. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I think it's just like, it's an interesting thing because there's numerous uh, studies about kids who learn differently, right? Like, and then we're, we're putting them into this sort of factory situation where everybody has to learn exactly yes. the same. Yes. Like I've learned about myself that I, st I, s I consume more audio information so I like to listen uh, to people talk about certain subjects. That's how I learned. Yeah. Um, but I don't like to sit in one location and be like staring at somebody giving yeah. a speech. Yeah. And that's, that's like the classroom sort of thing. So I would always be bored in class and I'd like start yeah. making jokes and all this stuff. But I'm also very good at like studying independently and then taking a test the next day. Yeah. But I also know another, other people who will study for two weeks and still fail the test. Yeah. But they're not, yeah. not, they're not stupid people. It's just they don't. They get nervous during the test, oh, they, you know, they forget answers. Like I yeah. was more like, yeah, okay, whatever. If I yeah. pass, I pass. If I don't. <laughs> like, Listen, you know? I, I'm a perfectionist yeah. procrastinator, right? Yeah. So I will wait to that exact like, last moment and yeah. then I will do everything I can to get it perfect. Yeah. Which I guess as an output from high school and university has taught me to work incredibly well under pressure. I, I can problem solving at the last minute is, is actually where I'm strongest. Yeah. But that's not something that you're acknowledged for once it comes in a high school or university setting, right? That's course, all about yeah. preparation and, you know, studying up to the same date. But at this moment, and I guess you would agree, problems happen overnight, right? Yeah. You suddenly, something becomes urgent, you need to react. 
proact, I'd say. But the, so then um, you said you sort of created your own career. What were the practical first steps you took after, yeah. after university to sort of get into what you're doing? So I met my first boss in university. He was a futurist. Yeah. And I remember he, because he spoke about this new world being opened up by new technologies. And you've probably heard the talk about disruption and exponential technologies. You know, the world is developing at a faster rate than we can ever do. And, and what he did was, or what he was very good at was putting a practice into it. So he, had an, he, he told me basically after this talk that everything you've learned in university, when you come out, is accelerating towards obsolescence, mm -hmm. right? So every day you don't learn, you get dumber. That's kind of the trade-off here. And every skill you have learned is going obsolete. The number game on this is, it's, it's a professor called John C.D. Brown from Singapore Management School. And he said the half-life of a learned skill has gone from 30 years down to five years. Yeah. So what this means is that everything you learned five years ago is irrelevant and everything you learned 10 years ago is obsolete. So I became really panicked about this because I was you know, I've wasted five years of my life, right? So I was determined. I told him, listen, I'll work for you and I'll work for free. And I'll figure out a way that I can make money for you and pay me. Yeah. That was basically it. I just want to use your name. And I started me and him just in a small office in Copenhagen. And today the company is running well. And Co Copenhagen is multiple departments now. And, you know, I'm still an associate partner to that organization. But, uh, but I chose to spin out my own engagement. And I found out that the product you sell in this regard is curiosity. Right? Yeah. And I think curiosity is one of these, these attributes that you have very high as a child. And then after a while, it just, you know, it plummets, right? Curiosity, fantasy, creativity, mm -hmm. these elements that are frowned upon almost because it's, it's child's play, right? But it, if you look at an established corporation, these are the things that are lacking. Because if you want to do something new, you got to be creative and playful and, you know, almost childish to a certain extent. Yeah, and if you look at some of the most successful Silicon Valley startups, like in the last, let's say, five to ten years, a lot mm -hmm. of them have scheduled meetings for creativity yeah. where you just kind of like shoot ideas on yes. the whiteboard and, exactly. you know, like for 30 minutes and, and get the, crazy with it and see, you know, what kind of crazy marketing campaign can we come up with. Exactly. And, and the questions are like vast, right? I mean... You can steer up a boardroom by asking them the question, what if your product was free? Think about that. Mm. And then they will come with every single argument for why the product will never be free. And I was like, yeah, but you know, look at Airbnb, right? Free hotel rooms, biggest hotel. Look at Uber, biggest taxi company, no taxis, right? <laughs> look at Airbnb, uh, sorry, look at Amazon, right? biggest distributor of e-commerce, doesn't really have any of the retail stores. They have a few, but they don't have the massive amount of it, right? So it... There are some new dynamics that, we, that you can be allowed to think about using these new technologies. Mm. And the question, what if your product was free, is no longer like a ludicrous question. That's actually a fair, fair position to assume if you have an established company that they are dependent on supply lines, right? This, sh this shit is disappearing. Excuse my language, but it, that, that's the reality of these things. Yeah. So, so this was the product. I would always, I would tell the truth, right? I would tell the truth, my truth, and I would always have the, the, an honest approach towards executives saying, I'd, I'd rather hurt you than lie to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is the truth we're going into. And obviously, this is, this is a sales pitch, right? But it, they were provoked. And provocation is sometimes the necessary feeling in order for you to act, right? You need to be provoked to act. Yeah. So, and, and you spent some time in London, right? So, yeah. So, um, I moved to London 2017, um, and where I set up my own company basically, and, and ran that for a good half year, eight months or something like this. Um, and and you know, in, in this process, I was negotiating before before making my company. I'd come to the Philippines and met this company, and I, I never really thought I was gonna leave London um, because at that point I had some engagements in London. I I was with my my former partner uh, girlfriend, and in this regard, I. I planned a life there, right? Yeah. And I think this is also an honest, uh, honest truth that comes into why I came to the Philippines. I mean, some people come here because of the women. I did too. I was just running from them, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of the, the setup in that regard. Yeah. But I wanted to come here. I wanted to set something up, whether it be my own or be on behalf of the company. And I think so far it's been good uh, with respect to certain changes and events, which we can elaborate later in the interview. Cool. 
Yeah, so you talked about um, it's been an awesome experience so far, but then it's also been difficult in actually working and in, in yeah. applying your knowledge here. Um, can you start off with some of the cultural differences, the cultural difficulties, yeah. uh, if anything, that yeah. you faced when you first got here? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, culture is is this great saying, when in Rome, right? When in Rome, do it as, as the Romans. And I think it's almost a, it's most, almost the opposite saying, for me at least, coming to the Philippines. Coming here to the Philippines, you should be careful about adapting too much to certain work routines or certain habits. And this is with all due respect to the, to the, to the culture of the Philippines. I think the ability that the culture has to be open-hearted I think that it's, it's a very emotional space you exist in. It's a strength, but it's also a weakness. Um, it's a strength in the regard that you can actually bond quite well with your business partners and, and your associates in, in the Philippines. But it's also difficult because sometimes the lines between professional and personal get blurred, right? Mm. And, and I think this was one of the, one of the first realizations for me that that the separation between professional and personal in comparison to working in London or working in Copenhagen where there's clear boundaries on you know, when we're working and when we're being personal together um, is, is kind of almost siloed, right? And yeah. here it's, it's very fluid. Um, I feel it's been, I think I, I can say I've hurt some people and I've been hurt, uh, which is something that's weird so to, say weird to say about your business. Right, yeah, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like I've been hurt in business. It's like not on my, not on my profit margin, but emotionally, right? I don't want to. It's like, <laughs> what the heck, man? Is, is that just a situation where you become because of the the fluidity of the personal and business, you become, uh, you start to set, you, you start to have expectations about how a person is going to treat you, and then they don't do that, or yes, but, yeah. yes, I think that's a good way of framing it. Yeah. You, I think in the beginning, also because I was alone, I, I came. As a, as a lonely Westerner in the Philippines, and I didn't have the network I have today, which I'm deeply grateful for because it allows me to vent, it allows me to to spare some of my experiences. Yeah. I think there's a clear culture shock that sets in for someone who's not mentally prepared for how the, I guess the the fluidity of culture with, between professional and private is in is in uh, in Philippines. You know, I'm, I'm half Thai, so so I can relate to some of the circumstances in, in regards to Thailand as well. But it's, it. I think it's different. I mean, it's. I worked a little in Thailand, not enough to say that I know the culture, the work culture. But it, it definitely feels like you can easily be pulled into a on a personal level when it comes to business. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. and I think I'm taking my precautions sometimes because you really. I mean, you really shouldn't mix these two. Yeah. I remember uh, sitting the first time we hung out and we had dinner. One of the questions I was asking about was a little bit of that, but a big part of it was the time setting meetings and the you know, oh, time I mean, management aspect. Of, you know, on uh, the etiquette yeah. aspect of it, yeah. yeah. My God, man. Like it's uh, meeting times, traffic, all these things. Uh, I mean, it's not good, right? And your your practical advice for me was just basically like, if you set a meeting with somebody, maybe go to where they are. Yes. So that you're, you're not waiting yes. for them to come to you. Then you have more control yes. over what time you see them. Yes. Um, and then something that I already started doing, which was just like, if I want to meet somebody at 11, I'll tell them 10. Yes. <laughs> like, said artificial <laughs> deadlines. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, all these tactics um, are good practices, but it's, um, you know, timing is, is all, a, Punctuality is something that's very important for me, right? Yeah. It's it's something that I really don't want to sacrifice. I it hate it being is late. for me as well. Like I mean, I was I was late for my hair, my uh, beard trimming by ten minutes, and I felt like really bad about it. Like, I called them before, hey, I might be late. Like you know, just like I just wanted to make sure. Um, and I, I mean, I my my schedule, I usually chart out, you know, to the minute for the day. So it's like yeah, I really I, pre- I get irritated when people are late for situations. Um, but I've, that's something that I've had to adjust to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I can understand. <laughs> okay, so the so the cultural side that's that those are some of the difficulties you faced. What about from the actual business side? I know. Yeah. I guess you've kind of mentioned a little yeah. bit of it, but are there any practical business issues that have come up with uh, with the company since you started working? With nah, it? I mean, yes, for sure. Uh, 
I think I've made the realization this is not just for the company I'm working for. I'm just, I'm not a corporate guy, mm. I think. I mean, at least not to the extent that I exist in corporate right now. I, I long for freedom, right? And I think this is also part of the creative space that I'm selling. Uh, I mean, I, I deal with business development and I, I do it in a regard that is very focused on either selling a product mm -hmm. or making it better, right? Those are the two things I'm focused on. And I think, unfortunately, my experience is that I've, I've become, instead of a specific like surgical tool, I've become abundant, almost like a, you know, a Swiss army knife. Like I do everything and it's fine, but it's not fulfilling. Yeah. So my experience is that you got to be very specific, right? You got to be specific in your value proposition and you got to stick to it. Mm -hmm. Because, and, and I think this goes for any corporate entity. Make sure that you remember why you are hired in the first place and stick to it. Because if not, you know, your path will be defined for you. And I guess this is part of the transition that I'm currently in as well. I mean, I'm looking to, to change into a startup entity now. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really a shift for me again to go through. But I, I miss this specific, specificity. Uh, not to say that a startup is specific all the time. Sometimes you need to, you know, do sales. Sometimes you need to do marketing. Yep. But at least you are, you know, you know what you're doing and you have a good idea of the output. And you're in, con to a certain extent, you're in control. Of to a certain extent, yeah, you're in control, yeah, right? Control, I mean, yeah. you, you get to fly the plane. <laughs> so that's, that's true. Um, what have been some of your business successes working for the, the corporate company? That you're yeah. I mean, I think uh, I quickly realized that my, my ability to build strategy and my ability to sell, to sell a vision or sell a brand or sell a story or a product or whatever is, has been by far most uh, the strongest asset I've brought to the game. Uh, so uh, without uh, spilling any confidential information, I've set up a number of strategic partnerships for the corporation. I've helped develop a number of uh, uh, different applications that help enhance the current supply chain and the supply line of the entity. Uh, the, the company I'm working for deals with uh, seven different industries, 24 different business units. It's, it's a pretty massive enterprise. And so there's, there's plenty of work to be done. And I think some of the specificity I managed to do was looking into, okay, here we need a technology solution. Here we need talent development. Here we need public-private partnerships, right? Th those were kind of the areas I, I went through. So it, it's been a it's been a good success, I'd say. It's been it's been very hard. Mm -hmm. um, driving change in a big company wow. is incredibly tough, and yeah. I have gained a complete respect because, of that. Just because of how many people have to sign off and things, and like the I mean, bureaucracy. Exactly, of it. exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, some of, we work with some some large corporates, specifically Structure Select, and uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, like for example, a, sa a sample. It's a very simple product. They didn't make any changes. It's added yeah. a logo to it. We will get it. I'm used to like, if we we work with a lot of uh, startups as well. I'm used to like dealing directly with the CEO yeah. of the company, yeah. or at least upper management. So we'll just send a sample to them. They'll receive it the same day. Look at it. Give us a A OK or tell us, hey, can you go back to the factory yeah. and make these changes? With Circ, it's like we send it. It's being received by their you know sample office or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, the girl that we work with, we have to let her know, hey, the samples arrived. Can yeah. you go check it out? She gets it. They schedule a meeting yeah. with the various departments. Yeah. Um, and then the CEO, oh, I think it was like a CF, the CF, who was it? And he was one of the, yeah, yeah. the chief executive, whatever. Sounds like a mace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was, they're supposed to be in on that meeting because yeah. they have to sign off with yeah. it. Yeah. But they have the meeting, that, that guy's busy, he misses yeah. it, so they have to wait another week and a yeah. half because he's then flying to Germany the next, it's like... Listen, and that's how it is. And that's like how three it is. weeks to sign off on a sample. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's yeah. how it is in big corporations. Yeah. Now, the fantastic thing about this company is that they have an extremely visionary CEO, yeah. right? So they have a CEO that is running this uh, conglomerate, 40 years old conglomerate yeah. as a startup, and he's doing so fantastic, right? And, he was the reason I came to the Philippines. I mean, he, I heard him speak. I heard him speak about the Philippines and the company. And, you know, it's, it's with all respect that I'm parting ways. It's because I know they're on the right way. I just have to find my own way. Yeah. 
because the company as it looks right now and with the team that is forcing its change agenda, it's, it's really doing good. It's really doing good. And so I think it's also this idea that when I work, I, when I started working, I, I told myself, let me try and see if I can make myself obsolete. Right? Let me see if I can embed my knowledge into the company and let the company go with it. Because in that case, my job is done. So obviously you're, you're in the business development sector and then now you're going into a startup world. Um, I guess my question is like, what is the overall business climate in the Philippines? Like what, what are the most successful companies doing um, and what are the emerging markets if, yeah. you, if you have some knowledge yeah. in that area? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the emerging markets, I wish I had come here earlier, man. Yeah. Like, that's the thing yeah. because friend said it well to me he said that the ceiling here is there's very there's a very it's very high up right so if you look at the western world the ceiling is very close to the head you it's, it's very hard to do anything basically you, you have it, I mean, everything's been everything is done yeah, right yeah so you have, he, to, you have to come up with the next instagram or <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah. the competition and the problems it's a completely different game right here you can basically do almost anything i mean and it's remarkable. It's remarkable for any entrepreneur. If you can solve a problem, come to the emerging markets, right? I mean, and, and they, because there's nothing but problems. And I think the climate in the Philippines is that there's an invitation to actually participate. Just despite all the governmental stuff of setting up a company enterprise and getting the visa and everything, you know, people welcome the help and the support of new ideas and new progress and new opportunities. And some of the things I've seen are, I mean, I, I'm very, I got to make a shout out to First Circle. Uh, I have some good buddies here in BGC who are, I mean, these guys are some, man, they're like Irish, Irish Navy SEALs. They're like, a, a, you know, I mean, these guys are amazing. You should meet them. Uh, they're a bunch of uh, former McKinsey, former, you know, management consultants that have come here and they've set up these uh, small uh, business loans to help small SMEs in the Philippines mm. uh, gain traction on their on their uh, yeah, products or growth or whatever and done so fantastic. I mean, they're really, really doing a good job on that. And, and besides that, I mean, there's there's a number of these different fintechs that are helping enhance the, it's a very cash heavy society. So just helping enhance the, the payables from, from smaller businesses, allowing them pay Maya to, to pay up with credit cards or you know, any form of, of uh, how do you say, any form of financing that is not necessarily cash, mm. um, I think that's remarkable as well. Uh, I mean, then we say have all these co-working spaces as well developing. I think that's a good way of kind of consolidating the yeah, ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Like right? every, it feels like every time I come here, there are more. Mm. Like uh, six months ago, I think when I first came here and I was here for a month, there was no WeWork in BGC mm. that opened up. There's mm. a bunch of other places that. We we tried out um, KMC, which is really cool. Mm. Uh, there's another one called the Office, which was really cool. Mm. And of course, the Refined is going to be opening say, up their right? their yeah. own in October. Like, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, we met here, so yeah, yeah. I guess these catalysts here are also I mean, just meeting people and hearing ideas and. Yeah, I mean, I'm working with. Uh, up. I mean, you're working with Mark, which I, which I want to touch on later. But like, I'm working with Mark and David and yeah. Jordan, where yeah. I all met yeah. here, uh, and Mark. Is one of my, Mark and David are one of my clients, and then on top of that, he's yeah. also referred clients to me. So it's just yeah. it's crazy. I was just here for two weeks in BGC, and it's like you know, you business partners, and you get also like additional money <laughs> to, to the business. Hey, that's a win-win, right? Yeah. Um, what do you love about living here? I think it's. I, I talked to uh, Joe Magnotti from Empire Flippers yesterday uh, about exactly that question I, I, and I think he had a good take on it it's the it's the freedom right it's you you have the freedom to to the you know develop the ideas the opportunities uh, that that you might carry around with and I think it's it you can do so with very little cash investment to begin with because there, there is plenty of help I mean I think the ecosystem of entrepreneurs here is it's unlike what I've seen other places. It's like there's a natural tendency that people want to support you and you know push you forward, maybe even invest in you. I think this enhancement of 
of, yeah, I have a good idea and I can make it happen. And I have a community around me that actually pushes me despite, despite them perhaps being strangers to a certain extent. Because everybody here is, is on that flow. At least the, the, the community that I have had the opportunity to meet here. Everybody's yeah. trying to create this idea that they have and push it forward. And, and I think this collective hive mind almost is, is, is a fantastic symphony that you can be part of. Now, besides that, I mean, it's just, it's a beautiful country. If you manage to get out of Manila once in a while, right? Um, it's, people are incredibly nice. I mean, it, I come from Denmark. We're the world's happiest country, right? Mm. I mean, but we don't have the same warmth and open-heartedness that the Filipinos have. Like you, it's very hard, I feel, to have a bad day when it comes to uh, meeting people and, and, you know, seeing a smile. Uh, of course, traffic is, is one thing you need to deal with, but people are very open-minded, very open-hearted. I think that's fantastic ability. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Even just today, we're walking around, it's just like everyone's greeting you and everyone's like, it's just, yeah, it's yeah. difficult to to feel like, yeah. you, like you're not welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas like in China, part of this is a language barrier, but it's just not, Chinese culture is not the kind of culture where people just greet yeah. each other randomly. Yeah. Like, you know, you just kind of go, you, I'll go days in China and I won't speak to anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, besides my staff. Yeah. Like, and that's it's just normal. And, and, and I think it's, a, just, just to your point, it's important for any expat or any Westerner coming here that they contribute to this, right? We're crying out loud, smile, right? Yeah. Send a smile, say hello, you know, get eye contact, you know. People here are fantastic. So the least thing you could do is just exchange a smile for a smile. Say, have a good day, or yeah. say, salamat po, or, salamat po. you know, just, just be open-minded about it. Yeah. Um, before I transition into what you're, what you're shifting into, uh, talk to me about how you found the Refined. And I mean, we kind of talked about it, we yeah. met here and you met Mark and David and all yeah. these guys, but how did you find the Refined and yeah. how, what has that been like for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was... I feel like I feel like no one should start paying me for these, man. Yeah, he should. You should. I'm doing like a whole refined series. If there's a reference like from you, people. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I was incredibly lonely in the Philippines the first few months, right? And I was stuck in Makati, and I thought Makati was all of of Manila, right? <laughs> and that way, I was working like fucking eighty hours. Excuse me, I'm swearing here my French it's, it's all good my I was working 80 hours a week and I didn't do anything I was trying to go for a run in Makati right and I was <laughs> choking on all the <laughs> NOx gases and everything it was terrible and then I found BGC and I remember coming here one night just walking around alone yeah and I googled different things and I found this you know website or Facebook page for refined and I went up here and it was like okay all right this is this seems cool. Like this is a place I can sit and work and maybe talk to people. And two days into it, I met Noel, and ever since that point, I mean, it's just been it's been kind of a second home. Yeah, a little temple, a little yeah. man's temple. So you typically you'll go to the office in the morning and then you'll come to refine like in the afternoon. -ish. I would try. I would try. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I usually. I was better at coming here earlier, but work has been adding up, right? But yeah. um, I, I try to come here and get a small uh, relaxing haircut or massage or, I mean, it's it's a great place to go offline, I'd say, right? Because if you engage in one of the services, just lay back and, you know, just reflect upon what's actually going on in your life and if you're on the same path. I think yeah. that Noel has done a great job infusing that mentality into the physical space of the refinery. Yeah. I'm interested to see what it's going to be like when they have an actual uh, dedicated court and space. For sure. It's going to be an interesting For sure. dynamic there. For sure. Because I mean, uh, you know, I've been working at <laughs> these co-working spaces and, and then, because like I'm not super productive when I'm here. Uh, no. <laughs> you can't. Yeah, you can't. But yeah, it would be interesting to have both of those in the same space. And it's also less, his, his thing is going to be less expensive than 90% like, yeah. of the other places. Um, so speaking of the refined, obviously you met Mark here. Uh, I've had Mark on the YouTube channel. You haven't seen that before. Yeah. Uh, I think I called it investing in Amazon FBA businesses. W what are you working on with Mark and yeah. how did that even come about? So, I mean, Mark is, for those who haven't, I would recommend seeing the podcast with Mark before uh, going any further than this one, if, if that's the case, because Mark is a, is a remarkable entrepreneur. I've, I've never, ever met 
someone as devoted to the cause as, as he he is. Um, his his history and story is also, I mean, it's something I, I look very much up to. I actually didn't meet Mark at Refined. I met him at a dinner uh, in a restaurant here in, in, in BGC. And I remember because I was I came from the office, I think I was wearing a suit. And Mark was <laughs> he was sitting on the other side of the table, further down. It was like it was an expat dinner. It was like 15 people there. And at uh, one point, he just <laughs> he yelled across the table, like, what do you do? <laughs> and I was like, oh, who is this guy? <laughs> and um, I told him a bit about what I could do from afar, right? And I yelled back at him, what do you do? And he said, I sell squeeze bottles, right? <laughs> and I was like, man, this guy, who is this guy? Yeah. So I was curious. And as I am about these things, I, I, I used to... As I said, I did business development. I used to study business model. As my master thesis was actually on exponential business models. So I would deconstruct um, Uber, Air, Airbnb, uh, uh, Dropbox, all these different companies that have made it to a billion dollars within the two-year radius, uh, two-year range. And I would try to figure out, you know, what are the components that makes an organization scale to a billion dollars. And what I realized was that Alpha Rock is an exponential organization. And, you know, exponential organizations are no guarantee for success, but it is a configuration of your business model that allows you to scale at a very low marginal cost of supply. So this is interesting, and, and you know, he, he can describe the details better than I can. I think this, the short story is that I'm working with Mark because I think I can help him make this a really, really big thing. Mm. There are, of course, some traits once you get into making this from a small FBA gathering of businesses into a formalized holdings company that can onboard new investors and, you know, old money in a somewhat agile manner. I think the switch from these two things are a lot more corporate governance. You know, there's formalities about partnership agreements and so on and so forth. And I want to let Mark do what he does best, which is find businesses and acquire them. And I want to help him and his team smoothen out the growth, the scaling mechanism in the company. Okay. So it can supercharge, basically. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And uh, was it just like uh, one of those things where you're sitting at the refined and Mark is talking about his issues and then you're giving him advice and then eventually he's like, why don't you just come and work with me? Well, I've... I've invested in the company very early on. I oh, was really? one of the first investors, yeah, and I've invested again in the second round. And this was before I, I had always approached by this opportunity. But I, you know, I've I've always devoted some of my hours as a pro bono manner. Um, part of my engagements as a behavioral economist is I work with founders. I've, I've worked a lot with startup founders in my career, just on the sideline, um, because I've always said that I'm not the guy with the greatest idea. But I think I can make your ideas even greater, right? And, and the idea here is to try and give founders leverage enough or time to think or space between their perspectives to, to stay ahead of the curve or hopefully avoid the unknown unknowns and known unknowns. And Mark Ruiz talks about that as well. He's more of a visionary. Oh, he is. Uh, yes. He's a visionary character. Yes. Yes. He needs somebody who's more in the systems. Space. I mean, Jobs had Wozniak, uh, right? And I mean, there's... I, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm the second hand to this, but I'm I'm saying that I think the team that has been set up around Alpha Rock is is a very very supercharged strong team. They just opened up an office, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or oh, so, did he did he buy a company that had an office already? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I think I cannot disclose that information at the current point, but uh, you are I think you're on the right. If you know you know Mark. That that's the pathway of his yeah, thinking. Yeah, I mean that's, yeah. that's exactly what Mark would do. Yeah. He's like, I want an office. I'm going to yeah. buy that company already as an office. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> if you can't beat them, buy them, right? That's uh, it's funny. So, so that's I think that's the idea here. Um, it it needs it needs formalities, and I can help with that. That's awesome. So you've talked about uh, sort of your cautiousness going into that. Can you can you explain where your mind is at with going into entrepreneurship? Oh man. I mean, you, you have to choose courage over comfort, right? And this is by far one of the most uncomfortable things that I've ever done. So I hope I'm being courageous. It's, I don't think I have an opportunity like this again, Rico. And, and I think in, in, you know, I'm 31. 
I don't have kids, I don't have a girlfriend, I don't have a wife, I don't have any commitments beyond myself. I think it's an opportunity for me to maximize my risk appetite and see just how far these things can go. Yeah. Um, it's not easy, it, it's very emotional. As I told you earlier, doing business in the Philippines, it, it is an emotional change for me and, and I can't help but feel vested heartily in my old engagements and going into the new one, of course, that's, there's a little heartbreak in that. Um, but I think if is this this idea that there is two kind of pains that you can two kinds of pains that you can expose yourself to right one is the pain of regret and one is the pain of discipline mm -hmm. and I think in this manner the pain of discipline is to try just to see how much responsibility you can actually take on your shoulders and see how far you can carry it and I think that rationale along with a great support from the Alpha Rock team and my, my community, as I said, here in the Philippines, everybody is supportive, have made me feel like I need to make this the right choice. Yeah, that's awesome. So leading into some of the, the final questions, sort of personal questions, where do you see yourself in the next, I know you're transitioning now, so it's a kind of a new chapter of your life, but where do you see yourself in the next, let's say, three to five years? Yeah, three to five years. I mean, given the current strategy, I would say that I'm still with Alpha Rock Holdings and I'm still... I'm still continuously supporting people to become better, right? Now, for my own benefit, I'd really see myself as someone who is finally financially independent. I mean, I, I've been working very hard to build up this passive income. And I think at that point in time, I'd be free enough to be able to make choices that before would be prohibited because of financial investment. Um, I hope I found someone that I could marry, yeah. but it's not a necess necess uh, necessary requirement. And I hope I'm a person who does not lie and a person who still thinks before he talks, or at least tries to, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> Do you see yourself uh, physically being in the Philippines? Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Uh, what are, what's the smallest thing you've done that's brought you the largest results in your life and business. Your life and business. Yep. Telling the truth and don't lie. Mm. I mean, no. it, it's so obvious, right? But I've, I think I came to realize that I was making a lot of small lies on the, uh, of the benefit of other people until I became 25, 26. And at that point, I realized that every time someone said, how are you? I would default say I'm fine. That's kind of the smallest change, right? And it disconnected myself from myself. And ever since, I kind of started thinking about these things. Am I saying something that's true to me? Or am I saying something that you would like to hear? Or at least I think you would like to hear. That made me a lot more comfortable about how I do anything in life. I mean, yeah. I'm... I try to speak my being forward, right? I don't try to lie about something because the problem with lies is that you have to keep track of them. And I think that was, that was a hard part of my life, right? And it was, a, it was white lies or it was the giving other people just the benefit of not needing to devote themselves to asking what's wrong. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. What are three books, blogs, or podcasts you'd recommend people to check out if they wanted to understand yeah. you better? Yeah, uh, <laughs> definitely. If 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 they wanna, if you wanna get into this idea of, of building yourself or defining the best version of yourself, uh, breaking the habit of being yourself by Dr. Joe Dispenza. It's a book I read perhaps every two years just to remind myself of of breaking out of these habits that we've just adopted because it benefits us at a higher dopamine level than other things, mm. but doesn't really benefit us in life, perhaps. So what, uh, check in your Facebook feed for likes and things like that? Yeah, that is one thing, yeah. <laughs> Definitely addiction to, to uh, smartphones, but also more in, in regards to who you're actually living your life on behalf, right? On, on behalf of who are you living your life, sorry. Yeah. Second book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, Jordan. Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. Yeah. Um, I mean, I must read for any man, I'd say. Uh, the, you know, this charge, uh, disconnect yourself from the political agenda that might be fluctuating around Dr. Peterson. Uh, you know, politically, that is something that can be discussed 
but fundamentally at what it means to be a, a man in the 21st century. I think 12 Rules for Life gives a, a fantastic outline of some of the abilities you as a modern man must adhere or pursue in order to fulfill that purpose which you brought into this world to fulfill. Last but not least, um, I think A16C podcast uh, from Andresen Horowitz, a uh, big uh, Silicon Valley-based investment company that just stays on the bloody curve with everything exponential. These guys have, these guys are walking the talk when it comes to new technologies, new trends, everything that that's novel introduced into this world, whether it be crypto, biotech, CRISPR-Cas9 for, uh, for, for genetic modification, space travel, whatever it might be, these guys will have a podcast around it. So nourish your curiosity, go down deep into these podcasts. I mean, fantastic and fantastic world of inspiration. And we're going to have uh, links for that in the description below. You're going to have to send me that last podcast. That mm, sounds mm, super mm. interesting. Oh, that's really great. Really great. Hey man, that's, uh, was there anything that we didn't touch on that you wanted to talk about? I mean, it's, uh, I, I guess the same reason that you make this podcast and the same reason we are here, you, you got to get back to your, your purpose, right? I, I feel that no matter where you are in the world, no matter what you do, it's, it's important in meditation to have just once in a while to invite yourself into this idea of what it is you are waking up in the morning for. Mm. Uh, because it's very easy to get caught up in the rat race, right? And sometimes the, the purpose-driven outcome or the why or whatever the hell you want to call it is a necessary reset button that allows you to get you know, clear-headed about what's important to you. And for a young entrepreneur, what you're pursuing, I'm not saying it's not what's important to you. That's up to you to figure out but you got to stay aligned on that purpose. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's extremely important. I mean, it's part of the reason why I'm here right now is I think I, I started asking myself that question. I was prompted by a lot of my friends. It was almost like a max exodus in China like last year. Uh, nice. So a lot of my friends left and I was just like sitting there. I was like, okay, why am I here? You know, and I, and I started thinking, well, like I started a business because I wanted the freedom to travel and live in different countries. I've been in China for four years. I need to travel more. I don't, do I actually have to be yeah. in the office on a daily basis yeah. or can I run the, the business remotely? And I started to ask myself those questions. What do I need to do? What do I need to set up to allow myself to be out of the office yes. more? Yes. And then I broke that down and we started to apply things. Yes. And now I'm, I'm able to do that. So yes. yeah, I think it's important to ask yourself that question. Yes. Why? Because I was, I was just like in China, just, you know, every day, usual business routine. And, wasn't necessary. Yeah. Um, can imagine. Wow. And another thing, another thing that you pointed out that I think is important just to reemphasize is the keeping a student mentality. Yes. So that's a big part of the reason why I do this. Is yes. Like I like to sit down with entrepreneurs that are that are in different spaces, uh, learn from people. I'm constantly learning from people. Uh, I constantly listen to podcasts and stuff like that for the same reason. And then um, we, we're filming a day in a life today. But I, I talked about this earlier. Is uh, the reason why I'm doing like Muay Thai. On a personal level, it has something to do with being a man and wanting to uh, wanting to have some sort of way to defend yourself in, yes. in combat. I like it. Like like <laughs> like I'm probably gonna go to war or some shit. But no, on the other side of it, it's it's learning a difficult difficult skill. Yeah. Because when you've been running a company for like four plus years and it, it's been steadily progressing, and now I'm kind of like known in my industry, and then we have the YouTube, and so I'm always getting positive feedback about what I'm doing. Like I'm always being put in an authority figure. So doing something where I'm not an authority, I have a coach, I'm a beginner in the field. Like there's, I was saying there's a 60 something year old lady who works out there who's, who could kick my ass. It's just like a humbling thing. And it just keeps you kind of like in that student mentality of like humble yourself, continue to learn, follow exactly. the steps, develop exactly. the new scope. So I thought that was important. That's a fantastic Humbleness, yeah, for sure. Yeah, which I mean, I'm I, like I'm cocky as it is, so I need to be humble. For yeah, time. yeah, I mean, it's easy. <laughs> you know? Cockiness enters yeah. our life, right? But it's yeah. that's we shouldn't fall from grace. Yeah, of course. Yeah. All right, man. So thank you for being on the podcast. Hey, man, I appreciate it. You as well, brother. We're gonna have uh, dinner a little bit later. Right? I look forward to it. All right, cool. So if you like this kind of content, uh, like, comment, share, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I will see you guys next week. Mm -hmm.